A Celtic state of mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for a Celtic state of mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and tonight I'm delighted to be joined by ex-Celtic manager at Liverpool and England internationalist Mr John Barnes. John, welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, how are you? Thank you very much, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. <laughs> it's been an interesting two days. Yes, it's been 48 hours of constant Twitter dialogue, which we will get to, John. I'd love to speak to you about your time at Celtic and in Glasgow. From there, we can talk about some of the topical issues regarding racism in society, but also in football. So, John, I watched with interest an interview you did with Richard Keyes and Andy Gray, and you quite clearly stated that racism did not play a part in your departure from Celtic Park. Over the last 48 hours, there's been a lot of dialogue between yourself and Celtic fans. What would you like to say to the Celtic fans at the moment in relation to the comments? Well, first of all, if you look what's happened in the last week, the comments I've been making, I've been making for the last 10 years, even before I was a manager. It is not about Celtic. It is not about John Barnes. It's about any black manager at any club is given less time than white managers. The only two clubs I've been at is Celtic and Tranmere, so the only two I can speak of. But I speak to a lot of my black counterparts who are managers at other clubs, and they go through similar things. So a lot of people think that it's, it's, it's talking about Celtic or talking about Tranmere as opposed to anyone else. It is not. It's got nothing to do with John Barnes, personally, necessarily, or Celtic or Tranmere. It's any black manager at any club who, when things haven't gone right, he has been given less time than white managers. That's obvious. It's a fact. Now, as to the reasons why, that's up for debate. And what has been happening on Twitter is that instead of just listening to what I'm saying, talking generally about black managers, and, and if you want to talk about me particularly, it has to be Celtic and Tranmere. But that's no different to, to Luther Blissett, to Brian Steen, to Ricky Hill, to, to Paul Ince, to Saul Campbell, to any black player who's been at a club. If you look at how long they are given when things don't go well, and then you look at throughout the cl- history of that club, white managers who have done either, either worse or the same as them are, is given more time. That is incontrovertible. You can't even argue that. And that's what people have been arguing to me about. I've never said Celtic should never have sacked me. In fact, Celtic have to sack me because once your position becomes untenable, you have to go. So I'm not saying that I should not have let Celtic. Celtic should not have sacked me. I'm not saying that Celtic is a racist football club and when I came, racism played a part in me getting sacked. Racism, unconscious bias, if you want to call it about unconscious racism, plays a part in all of us. I am unconsciously biased towards certain people based on what I've been wrong and told about them. That is a fact. That is a fact. But what happens is, if I say that about Celtic and a Tranmere, and what I've been having on Twitter, it's all Celtic and Tranmere fans saying, no, 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 no. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. Unconscious bias has nothing to do with you losing your job. You can speak to any black manager at any club, and you speak to those fans from those clubs, and they will say, no, 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 no. That did not play a part. So as much as maybe, possibly, Celtic fans, if it's not to do with Celtic, and you can use anybody, let's use Chris Hutton at Brighton, and you can say, well, possibly... Racial bias played a part in Chris Hutton. Celtic fans may, may say, well, yeah, yeah, I can see that, possibly because we know what it's like, but not at our club. Brighton fans will say, not at our club. Macclesfield fans will say, not at our club. So who, where is it then if everyone says it's not me? 
So it is not personal, and I don't take it personally to me either. I don't say it's a personal attack on John Barnes that, you know, they may have subconsciously, unconsciously thought that maybe I'm not up for the job, which meant that I would lose my job. And of course, of course, if you, if you lose football matches, you will lose your job, regardless of whether you're black or white. The point I'm making is that black managers lose their jobs quicker, which is proven. So the reasons why you lost your job, we can debate, and I'm willing to debate that, but you can't debate the fact that black managers lose their jobs quicker. And that's the whole point I'm making. And all I've been getting from Twitter is that you lost your job because you're a crap. I said, yes, okay, I was crap, I lost my job. You had crap white managers, they lasted longer. Why? And I've been asking everybody that question who said you didn't lose your job because it's got everything to do with any unconscious bias towards, pe towards you or, 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 or black people generally. And I've said, well, what is it then? Why, not why I lost my job, because I know why I lost my job. I didn't win enough matches. But why have white managers who have lost more matches than me, had a worse record than me, lasted longer? And this has happened for the majority of black managers. But what they'll do, they'll throw in Frank Reichardt didn't do that. So, of course, there's always one. Very much like saying, I'm not racially biased because I voted for Obama. And Beyonce is my favorite and I live next to a black person. So we accept it when we see it, because all I've been told is prove it. Where is the evidence? Prove it. Where's the evidence? And there is no evidence. And until we saw George Floyd, did we not believe? Black people know that that happens all the time. But look how, how outraged white people are because they never saw it. So they probably thought, that doesn't happen. But now they've seen it, they've gone. So the fact that they hadn't seen it before doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It always did happen. So the fact that you cannot prove, because you cannot prove unconscious bias. You cannot prove implicit bias. You can prove explicit and overt Racist, bi racist bias, but I use it very similarly to unconscious conditioning towards sectarianism. You'll accept that Celtic and Rangers have this sectarian issue whereby young kids are brought up to believe subconsciously, unconsciously, even consciously at times, that the enemy, who may be Protestant or Catholic, are different and worse and, and th th than they are. And if they accept that and they know that to be a fact, why can't we accept the fact that possibly because of what's happened in 300 years of disenfranchisement of, of black people and the narrative that's been around a black man's worth from an intellectual point of view, why can't we believe that that's a possibility? And all I've been getting is that Henry Clarkson, black players, I said, from a playing perspective, I accept that. Any black player now would be accepted because of his talent. So it's not a question of being racially biased towards black players, because if you go on there and you score goals, people are going to accept you. Or if you save goals, or if you're a good player, they'll accept you. And then they're talking about Kenny Dalglish being a Protestant and, and, and Jock Steen. And they say, we accepted them. They accepted them because they were fantastic. Great players, great managers, they did well. If Kenny Dalglish or Jock Steen, being Protestant, were bad players, they would have been given less time, less support than a bad Catholic player. And, that's how it, and, 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 that, is, and that is obvious. So I, I haven't said anything to upset anybody, but people seem to be taking, think, think I take it personally and saying that I left Celtic because Celtic are a racist club. Of course I didn't. And of course, Celtic had to sack me. I understand that. But the reasons why they did is, now that if you want to then go on to talk about my time at Celtic, which I'll talk about my time at Celtic, which people will then say, as they've always said, that's just an excuse. I will tell you about my time at Celtic, unless we have any more points to make. And I hope I've cleared this up. I'm not attacking Celtic Football Club. Celtic Football Club is no more racist or no less racist than any other football club in the country. But we all feel as football clubs that we are different. We are special. So we'll say Rangers fans are my brother knows an Evertonian and he will tell you about Liverpool fans. And I say, no, you're all the same. One happens to support Liverpool, one supports Everton. He'll say, no, no, this is the character of them. But it's not because this is the way he has been conditioned to think. And the way we've been conditioned to think about black people, women, gays, and I've made a point on Twitter to talk about it. who would you rather go to war with, a skinhead or a gay? And people will say it doesn't matter to me. It does because we've been conditioned to think that a skinhead would be better at fighting. It is, uncon it is unconscious conditioning. So until people are going to accept that, we will never move on. Do you think, John, that because obviously unconscious bias exists and, and I think most free thinking people accept that, can people be rewired though, John, through education and through speaking to people who have suffered at the hands of bias, can people change their thinking process? They absolutely can, but first of all, you have to explain to them, A, why it's wrong to think that way, how they, how they started to think that way, and more importantly, the first thing they have to do is accept it. But no one is accepting it. Because everyone on Twitter has been saying to me, no, no, we're not unconscious bias, no. And then if you go to other clubs, they'll all say no. The Tranmere fans will say no. The Brian fans will say no to Chris Hutton. The, the Macclesfield fans will say no. To so unless we're going to accept it within ourselves, and I'm saying I accept it within myself. If I'm going to go to war, would I rather go to war with a skinhead or a woman? A skinhead. 
because of what I've been wrongly told. And because I know that and I accept it, I then say, well, maybe I'm wrong. Let me find out. And let me try and change. But if I'm not willing to even accept it, rather than what people will say is that doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter to me. And I use the, 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 the situation with knife crime. When knife crime was rampant in, in Glasgow, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, whatever it was, whatever it was. And the perception down south was that these Glaswegians are just thugs who are killing each other. They didn't look at the socioeconomic problems within the inner cities of Glasgow and saying, it's not a problem with being from Glasgow. It's a problem with the socioeconomic situation. And it works both ways. We have this thing, and I've just tweeted because I'm not going to tweet about this anymore. About self, I'll tweet about racism all the time, but not in football. We have this thing that Frenchmen make good lovers and, and, and Italians have style. Because if you go to Italy, and you go down Rome High Street. I know there's not a Rome High Street, but just to make it simple for people. And you see an Italian with a Gucci hat, Versace down his sleeve, Labutan across his chest. You'll go, look at that. He's very stylish. You go down Socky Hall Street and someone from John Chapel wearing that, you'll say he's a chat because of the way we're conditioned to think. Scottish managers. I remember when I first came to England, you had Dalgleish and you had Jock Steen and you had, you know, Alex Ferguson. You got Bill Shankly. Scotsmen made great managers. That's what the narrative was. Everyone wanted a Scottish manager. Now, all of a sudden, where, where are they? Scotsmen didn't make good managers. Good managers made good managers. But because you then had a perception that Scotsmen good managers, Scotsmen were given jobs because they were Scottish. Yes, they made good or bad, but they had an advantage over, other, over English managers because the perception was Scotsmen make good managers. So if you understand how that works in terms of the unconscious bias we feel because of the way we've been told, what have we been told about black people for 400 years and their worth, their intellect, their morality, of course, we can run, we can fight, we can play football. Because physically, the perception is we're, we're good. Whereas what is management? Leadership. So we're told, yeah, I've got an ability to lead. And forget about the fans. But if this is a narrative that everybody holds, how are the players even going to fall into that? When you come to that club, and this is nothing to do with footballers, football fans, postman, milkman. This is a narrative surrounding society in terms of a woman's a homosexuals, a, a gay, a, a black person's intellect. Then all of a sudden, a black person takes over at, a, at an office or forget football anywhere. And if everything is going well, of course, because we want to be right minded, we will all say, yes, we're going to support him. Of course, we support him. Then when things start to go badly, that is when all of a sudden those subconscious, unconscious, stereotypical views that we don't even know are within us. They come to the fore and we'll think it's something else. I use Brendan Rogers as an example. Brendan Rogers went through this at Liverpool. Fantastic manager, as is proven. Then all of a sudden, Brendan Rogers, towards the end, was like, Brendan Rogers doesn't, doesn't know what he's doing. Brendan Rodgers is a good manager. Jurgen Klopp comes. Jurgen Klopp has got the same record as Brendan Rodgers for two years. The same record. His record wasn't any better, but we supported Jurgen because we had more faith in Jurgen because we have more faith in foreign managers than white British managers. So even white English managers, British managers go through the same thing. Sam Allardyce, David Moyes, Eddie Howe, Sean Dyche will tell you they will not get a top six job. It's because white managers, are, white English managers aren't any good because the perception is foreign managers are better. So even if white English managers, British managers are being discriminated against, how inconceivable it is that black managers are discriminated against. I think, John, what I'd, I'd like to make a couple of points because obviously uh, there are Celtic fans who feel quite aggrieved at the some of the, some of the comments. It's not personal. Some of the comments. I mean, you, you were at the club for, for eight months and I think the, the general makeup of Celtic fans football club as a fan base I don't think you can bracket them in the same category as for example a Rangers fan base and the reason for that is that they are predominantly of Irish descent all right Irish Catholic descent and in Scotland there is a huge issue of anti-Irish hibernophobia or racism now when you have been conditioned to understand that for generations and I'm going back to the first manager being Willie Maley talking about the, the creed of a player, the nationality of a player not being important. Us being the first club to sign an Indian player in Salim in the 1930s. Gil Heron, Jamaican, comes and plays for Celtic in the 1950s. First black player in Scotland. Paul Wilson, who was the first non-white Scottish internationalist of the 20th century. I think Celtic fans have got far more of an understanding and the unconsciousness doesn't exist to the same degree, John, and I think that is why people are taking it personally. Well, well, so you're telling me that no Celtic fans have ever racially abused a black player? 100% they have. I mean, the biggest issue was obviously in 87 with one of your ex-teammates, Mark Walters, and it was a disgrace at the time, it's a disgrace now. We can't airbrush that out of history. I thought Celtic fans didn't do that. 
No, there are always members of all groups who are capable of doing it, John. Celtic fans only do different to anybody else. I, I think, think fans are not different to anybody else because Rangers fans will say the same thing. Rangers fans and, and, and Swindon fans will say the same thing. Tranmere fans are saying the same thing. And this is the problem because we all believe, because you're a Celtic fan and you can say, not us. And that's the problem because now with George Floyd, everybody's now talking about that policeman and going, oh, the police are terrible, but not us. Oh, football fans are terrible, but not us. Do you know Amy Cooper? Amy Cooper was that, that woman who called the policeman on, called the police on that black man in America um, when she said she was being threatened by a black man. Amy Cooper is a white, liberal, Obama-supporting, Trump-hating woman who would say, I'm not racist in any way. Then in times of confrontation and stress, and when you are antagonized, you then go revert to what you have been unconditionally, what you've been uncondi- unconsciously conditioned to do. So it's not a conscious thing. So I understand. Now, if they were to consciously think this is wrong, but that is not what unconscious bias is. And this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Celtic fans consciously, you know, being racially biased towards anybody. But if in 1987 against Mark Waters, and I'm sure other black players, Ron Wallace, I'm sure went, I'm sure other players went through it as well. I don't know why we all of a sudden assume that Celtic fans would never be, and that was probably more conscious, presumably, but I'm talking about unconscious bias. And it exists within all of us. And we cannot say, because we are Celtic, and I, you know, you're know, you Celtic podcast, because I can go on the Swindon podcast, I can go on the Bristol City podcast, any podcast, and they'll say the same thing. So if you're all right, you're right. Celtic fans aren't biased whatsoever. Bristol City fans aren't biased whatsoever. Swindon fans aren't biased whatsoever. Who's biased? No one. Or is it just, or is it just John, we agree with you, but not us. Well, I think I, I've, I've got to defend the Celtic support, John. And yeah, I will take it on the chin that there are elements of every support, including Celtic, who will have that unconscious bias. And the people who abused Mark Waters in 1987. But that is where this is not the issue. That's where this is not the issue. My issue was making a statement that black managers, black managers are given less time than white managers. That's a fact. You can't argue with that. And that's the only point I was making. That's the only point I was making. Now, as to why... I, I was getting people on Twitter, you lost the dressing room. I never lost the dressing room because I never had the dressing room. From I got there on day one, I didn't have the dressing room before I'd even walked in. It's a bit like David Moyes at Manchester United. David Moyes at Manchester United. When he went to Manchester United, he went on a preseason tour to Malaysia, somewhere like that, Thailand. This is Sir Alex Ferguson's team. This is David Moyes' first two, three, four that days in charge. So he plays a game, his first preseason game, they lost against a Thai team. The fans booed David Moyes. What has that got to do with David Moyes? And the players then know, because the fans didn't like David Moyes, that, well, we're not going to play for him. Is that David Moyes' fault? Has David Moyes been a horrible person? Has he bollocked the players? Has he done anything? And straight away, he's doomed for failure because the dressing room behind him. Now, if I came to Celtic, and we'll talk about this, if I came to Celtic and I was a horrible person, slaughtered the players, I came with this big attitude and, and, and after five games, after, you know, 10 games, after whatever, the players didn't like me. So therefore, I've lost the dressing room and we're going to lose. Maybe you can then say, OK, he had a chance. He's lost the dressing room. The first week at Celtic Park before we played one game, I had lost the dressing room because, and I want to know, and, that's, and that had nothing to do with my colour. That had nothing to do with my race. But if I tell you about when I came to Celtic, what had happened, then you'll understand. And there are two separate issues. There are two separate issues as to the issue when I'm talking about race and unconscious bias and for all managers, that's a separate issue to the fact of what happened to me at Celtic and my experience at Celtic had nothing to do with my, with my race or my colour. It had nothing to do with that. And when people find out what that is, then maybe they'll think, well, yes, um, I understand what he's saying in terms of unconscious bias generally, and maybe that may have played a part. Everybody has their opinion. I'm not going to discuss that with you. But then when they ha- hear what I talk about when I, when I went to Celtic in terms of the problems that I had from day one before I'd even said hello to anybody, then maybe they'll think that, well, it was never going to be, it was never going to work for him. I look forward to, to hearing that, John. And I'm taking your points on board. One thing I would say before we move on to your Celtic career, which I'm really interested in hearing about, Neil Lennon, the archetypal Celtic man, if, if you want to put that in inverted commas, Irish Catholic. He suffered abuse for years in Scotland due to his religion. And Neil Lennon, in October of 2011, four months in the job, was sitting at Rugby Park 3 nothing down at half time. He's admitted himself, had he not turned that round, he was getting sacked. So that, there are always examples oh, of... And was, was he given a chance to turn it round? He, he, 
pulled it back in the second half to 3-3. Three, three, and he went on to become a success, as you know. Yeah, at, at so he was given a chance to turn it round. But if I was to use, and we'll get to this, the inverness Cali game, where there's a there's a situation at half time where you need to turn that round, and hopefully you can tell me why that didn't happen because you had the players at your disposal, um, you didn't turn it round. That was a cataclysmic re- result for Celtic and the fan base. Lennon didn't suffer that, and therefore he, he maintained and continued in his job. Now, John, well, why, but why are we looking at why are we looking at one? But I'm not looking at any one particular incident. But I'm not looking at myself. My comment is that black managers, and are you then saying that black managers are given the equal opportunity as white managers? Is that what you're saying? No, because you can prove, you can prove, you can prove with statistics that what you're saying is correct over the board. Black managers are not given the same opportunities as white managers. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. So and that's and this whole argument on Twitter is that disagreeing with what I'm saying, saying it's got nothing to do with colour and nothing to do with, with, with race. And, and it is because, and I'm not just talking about myself. And what they'll say is, that, so it's a coincidence that every club where a black manager has been, 99% of clubs, where the black manager has been given less time than white managers who've done equally as, as who's done worse or equally to them, because I don't want to compare myself to Martin O'Neill. Martin O'Neill did this. Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon was fortunate. We know where Rangers were when they went there. I would like to think if Rangers were, were, were when I was there, I would like to think that I would be able to win the league and do what I did. I would like to think that. I'd like to think anybody could. So to look at what Neil Lennon has done at a time when Rangers were in the club, they were, and I'm not even talking about Neil Lennon. Um, Tony Mowbray, Lou Macari. These are managers with arguably worse records than mine, but they lasted longer than me. Yes, it was only two months longer, but regardless of how long it is, the point I'm making is nothing to do with me. It's every manager has given less time than white managers. And that's all I'm saying. And I happen to be at Celtic, so I have to mention Celtic. If I was at Liverpool, I'd mention Liverpool. If I was at Coventry, I'd mention Coventry. But the fans shouldn't take it personally to think I'm having a go at them. I'm talking about society as a whole. Mm-hmm. And, and there is... There are clearly issues in society when it comes to race, John, and we'll talk about that as we go through this conversation. The, the two guys you mentioned before we get to your time at Celtic, Mowbray and, and McCarry, excels with an affinity with the club, an affiliation with the club. So Once again, let's make all the excuses we want. We can always make excuses. We can always say, yeah, but this is the reason why. So what you're actually saying is that that's not the reason. And everybody in their club will come up with another reason why as well. So you're not unique. And I've heard it all before. I've heard it all before from people who are talking about, well, the only reason is because this, the only reason is because that. And you can come up with it. So what you're actually saying is it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. No, it doesn't exist at your club. But it exists in other clubs. What I'm saying is that there is unconscious bias. It doesn't always have to be a racial element attached to that. So if we're... What what are unconscious biases with it? Of course. Of course, but I'm, that's why I'm saying I'm not talking about me. Because in many respects, I actually said when I was up there, and when it actually came to an end, my Englishness probably played a, a bigger role than my colour. Because I'm English and I wasn't affiliated with Celtic. So is that not unconscious bias, the fact that I'm not affiliated with Celtic? So therefore, they love me, they want me to win, they'll support me. But when I don't win well, that's when unconsciously, you weren't affiliated with Celtic, so therefore we're going to sack you earlier. You're proving my point. Unconscious bias towards me because I wasn't affiliated with Celtic. I do agree with that unconscious bias. What I'm saying is it's not racially motivated bias. It's unconscious bias because there's no affiliation. Ronnie Dyla had the same problem, John. But no, 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 no. But whatever it is, whatever it is, there is a perception. So you're saying there's no perception of black inferiority, morally or intellectually, in Scotland or in Glasgow or in Celtic. The, no, I would say it's Celtic, no. I would say it's Celtic, there is no. Bradford, at, at Bradford, they say no as well. And at Coventry, they'll say no. And at Bristol, they'll say no. And at Swindon, they'll say no. And everywhere else, they'll say no. If I speak to them on their podcast, they will say the exact same thing as you. And you will say, you will disagree with them because you'll go, no, 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 because we know it exists. We know it exists, but just not us. So everyone will say no. Like Amy, like Amy Cooper, like you say to, to, to people, do you believe in equality? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. What, is this, what does society show us? But you speak to people, you, sp- you say to football fans, have you racially abused a, a black player? I haven't. I haven't. Oh, we've all heard it, but no one's done it. No one's done it. So when Sky did a, Sky did a poll, 85% of fans said they heard racist abuse. 95% of fans said they didn't report it because they thought nothing will be done. And they asked all these questions. If they asked the question, have you done it? How many people do you think will say yes? One, two percent. So for 86 percent hearing it, one, two percent have done it. Who's doing it? Not us. 
No, it, it definitely exists, John. What I would just say before we move on to the football, right, is Celtic as a fan base should be aware of the Green Brigade. Right, they're they're a, a hardcore section of Celtics fans. Left wing sensibilities politicised. Uh, Amy Cooper, Amy Cooper in America, left wing, left wing Obama supporting Trump hating Amy Cooper. Yeah, yeah but you, no, but you can't say because they're left wing that they're going to have racial tendencies. I mean, no, no, left wing, left wing no aren't supposed to have racial tendencies. But that's the point I'm making. Left wingers aren't supposed to have racial tendencies. So when you but, say a left wing element. Of course, they've got racial tendencies, just like Amy Cooper, who's a left-wing liberal, Trump-hating, Obama-supporting. And she supports... If that didn't happen three weeks ago, Amy Cooper would have been on the front line for the Black Lives Matter with George Floyd. That's who she thinks she is. But unconsciously, when times of stress happen, we subliminally and unconsciously revert to what we have been shown about people. Be they Catholics, be they gays, be they women, be they black. This is what society has wrongly told us about each other. So for us to deny that and say, yes, I agree with what you're saying, but we've got a left-wing element that doesn't, just like the left-wing ele- element in America. But that left-wing element, what I was explaining, it may not have made the news, but they went out as a result of what's happened over the last few weeks and non-aggressively have renamed streets in Glasgow. Have you heard the story? It was on Twitter. You, you must have seen it. No. And th- this, is, th- this shows how the Celtic fans react uh, to... The, the the racist behaviour of, of anyone around about the club. I, I've so, before, so, so why didn't they do that last year, the year before, two years ago, ten years ago, when racism was still rife? Because they didn't see it. Now you've seen George Floyd, they react to that. But do they believe that that hadn't been happening? Do they no. believe that... So why were they doing it before? Were they aware of it? Did they not know that 30% of slave traders in Jamaica were from Scotland? 30% of the slave traders in Jamaica were from Scotland. Did they not know that? No, I'm sure they do know it, John. I'm sure they do. And and you know what? So why weren't they marching before? Well, Does it take that George fan base for us to see it, for us to do that? That fan base has campaigned for various oppressed uh, countries, cultures. I mean, if you, if you look at what they did for the Palestinians, I mean, that, that made worldwide news. So Burn. I understand, so, but that doesn't mean they're not sub- unconsciously racially biased. It doesn't mean that they see everybody as equal. The fact that you know what's right, right and what's wrong, as Amy Cooper does, I'm sure Amy Cooper would have been campaigning as well. But I'm talking about in times of stress when things don't go well. And you can't tell me that though, any of those left-wing Celtic fans did not racially abuse Mark Walters. Well, or is that what you're saying? That group, that group, it was probably not because of their age group, John. But listen, not even one. All oh, right, well, take- maybe because of their age group. Anyway, we can we can argue this forever, like on Twitter. We're not arguing. We are having a debate, John. We are having a debate. We can debate. We can debate this point like on Twitter till the cows come home. I've been invested in this for 35 years. Yeah. People have invested in it for two days. Two days they've been invested in it. And coming up with, oh, in the last two days, let me think about this. No, 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 no. Because that's wrong. That's wrong. 35 years. And black people have been going to this for 400 years. And people are now, because of George Floyd, everybody's now, oh, what's my opinion on that? It's terrible. It's wrong. We are now... We are now outraged because we've seen it. We've seen it. A black man was killed in Scottish prisons. Mm-hmm. Sheku Bale in Scotland. Yeah, I didn't see anybody taking a New York going on, uh, on, on marches then. This has been happening for years for black people. And now all of a sudden, because it's Pierce Morgan is now coming out and defending us. Come on. And Pierce Morgan would tell you he's not got a, a, a racially biased bone in his body. Whereas six weeks ago, he's talking about black, black on black crime, black people killing each other. It's a black problem. And now all of a sudden, Oh, we have to get behind black people. And what are they now saying? What are they now saying? Oh, um, we have to learn about black history. We have to empathize with black people. You got Holly and, 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 and Philip Schofield saying, that's what we need to do. And all of these white liberals saying, that's what we need to do to help. Because, you know, all of these other racists, not us, not us, it's these other racists in America. That's where it is. So aren't you lucky to be in England? Because we're now supporting you and George Floyd. Whereas when it's been happening here for years, when it, no one is interested. And we pat ourselves on the back now because we're going to come down hard on America. We're going to come down hard on America because we've seen it. And we're going to say to black people in Britain, could be worse. You could be over in America. That is how unconscious bias works. And people can avoid it. People can avoid it. You'll say, do you think, you sp- I take to my teammates who I played with, you ever racially abused anybody? Never. Never. They used to call me in training. And now what are they saying? They've even heard it. Can I prove it? No. 
But if you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. And it's the people who aren't affected by it are the first ones to then say. But when Scotland wants to talk about Britain, England, not the government because you're part of Britain, not supporting financially what's going on in Scotland, and people in London are going to go, that's rubbish. That's rubbish. Everything's staying in Britain. You know in Scotland that you're being disenfranchised and you're being forgotten about. But in England, we'll say, no, you're not. No, you're not. You haven't got anything up there. You don't bring anything to us. You get what you deserve. And then what do you say? No, that's wrong because we are being disenfranchised. All the money's staying down south. No money's coming up here. And that's what black people are saying. And what are you saying? No, that's not the case because we are not like that. Have empathy with other people because you go through your problems as well and you want people to empathize with you. No, you're right. We do. We do, John. What I'm trying to make the point of is, as a Celtic fan base, being predominantly Irish or of Irish heritage, we've suffered at the hands of racism in Scotland. And, and Working class that, people suffer. Exactly. More Working classes suffer. Mm-hmm. And it's not racism because the Irish are a different race to the Scottish, to the English, to the French. That's not racism. Hibernophobia. I understand. I totally understand that. But that's not racism. So you have sectarianism. You have discrimination of all forms. But discrimination based on on, on colour is different. Discrimination based on what we consider to be race is different. Because before 400 years ago, race as we know it didn't exist. You could have a black king. The race would be, if you're a Roman, you could be black, you could be white, you could be Chinese, and be a Roman citizen because you buy into the ideological and political identity of a particular region, you're the same race. And that's the way it should be. It shouldn't matter about color. But then when all of a sudden, 400 years ago, when in the Enlightenment period, the Enlightenment period, when it became man's individual rights, how can you enslave a man who looks like you? That is when serfdom was addressed. That is where slavery, because you had slavery in Scotland, in England, everywhere before you had transatlantic slavery. That was addressed because the right-minded people from a religious point of view or from a, a political point of view said it's wrong to enslave people. So then something had to be done for you to enslave somebody else, which was nothing to do with racism, slavery was nothing to do with racism, it was to do with economics. Getting somebody to, to, to work for you for free and not pay them. Now, you can do that with white people because other well-meaning white people in the Enlightenment period, when a man's individual rights came to being, was saying you cannot do that to another person. So then, if you could get somebody who aren't people because they look different, black, you can then say the Bible says, the Hermetic prophecy, these people are different. You can have the greatest minds, geneticists, anthropologists, scientists, saying that genetically these people are inferior to us, they're morally and intellectually inferior, from an intellectual point of view and a scientific point of view, you can peddle that for 300 years so that eventually someone like Winston Churchill can believe can believe in eugenics, and we all do, without even knowing it, or think that we believe in racial hierarchy, so unconsciously, to then, when all of a sudden something happens, if we, we think automatically, you're inferior, you're superior, and we don't know why we feel that way. This is not what it was before, but this is what it is now. And you ask yourself, why do you feel that way? And we don't know, because this is how subliminal conditioning has worked for 400 years. And we think we can get rid of it by just saying, we're all equal. You know, we're all equal. We're all the same. Cut us, we all bleed. So for 300 years of indoctrination, and I use the point of Scottish managers, I use the point of Frenchmen, once you keep telling people that this is the way they are, people believe it. And people automatically are conditioned subconsciously, unconsciously to believe it. Now, when we're rational moments, we know we're wrong. But in times of confrontation, just like Amy Cooper, who would say she's not racist, we then unconsciously go to what we believe. So I know what you're talking about, the Irish people, and we were subjugated and we were, you know, um, in fact, look, the, the Scots people were planted in Northern Ireland for the Protestants uh, to be for Northern Ireland to become Protestant. So I know all that, and I know that you've been discriminated against, but people who have been discriminated against, and you know you've been discriminated against, but people will tell you that. They'll say you're making an excuse for your unworthiness, for your laziness, for whatever it is. You should empathize with people when they say to you, we're discriminated against. And so therefore, empathize. people who are discriminated against should empathize, but they don't. I, they say it's an excuse. I empathize with you, John. That's why I want to speak to you tonight. You know, I, I do want to hear your point of view and I want to put that out because I don't believe Twitter's the best vehicle to get that point across. It's very difficult to get Especially that point Especially as across. much as I talk, you know, I talk a lot. <laughs> and I can't type very well. So, you know, I need, I need, that's why I'm glad. Thank you very much for having me on. No, it's a, ple- it's a pleasure. The discussion we had, we can talk all night about unconscious bias. It exists and I will never change. That's why I'm not going on Twitter to talk about this again because I will never, ever change your mind. You'll, you'll never change my mind. I'll never change their mind. I know what I know to be the truth. Black people will say the same thing. 
and, 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 and people from Celtic or people from Rangers or from other clubs said, no, no, that's not true, whatever. So there's no resolution in terms of that. We, we, we will agree to disagree. Uh, disagree. But the interesting thing for me would be to get my, my real story about what happened at Celtic. And uh, this has got absolutely nothing to do with race. Brilliant. Yeah, that, let's do that, John. Let's do that. But uh, I do appreciate your input and what you're saying to me is making me think because I am, for me, and I, I would say I'm a diverse, I'm of a diverse mind and uh, I would say that I'm not uh, unconsciously or otherwise racist. Um, so thank you for your views because I've got to listen to your views because you've suffered racist issues within football, within society and I've got to take that on board so thanks for sharing that. Um, let's talk about Celtic. Let's talk about you coming up here and to be quite honest with you it was very exciting as a Celtic fan for John Barnes to come up here and it was called like it or loathe it the dream team yourself and Kenny Dalglish and yeah you were in a minority in in that you hadn't played with the club very few managers at that point had not played for Celtic and uh, you you came up it was your first time uh, as a manager how did you hear about the interest how did that how did that actually materialise I was speaking to um, Sheffield United. I just retired. I speak to Sheffield United, and typical of Kenny Dalglish, if Kenny wants to do something, uh, it, it, Kenny's a very straightforward person. Kenny phoned me and he said, uh, "Barnsley." I'm not going to do a Scottish accent. People are going to accuse me of being um, racist or whatever it is because you can't do that anymore, you know. And I don't mind Bo Selector and Craig David, but anyway, that's a different issue. I don't mind that at all. Um, and Kenny said, "Listen." Um, I'm going to, to Celtic as, um, as a technical director. He goes, do you want to come, head coach? I went, what? I said, I haven't heard from Kenny for about two years. We don't speak all the time. I said, Kenny, I've, I've got to think about it. He goes, all right, just let me know. And I thought it was a bit of a throwaway line. So I was speaking to Sheffield United, funny enough, to be the manager. But Sheffield United were waiting, waiting, waiting. Then Kenny phoned me off for another week. And I thought I'd never hear from him again. And he phoned me off another week and he goes, so uh, what, are you coming or what? And I went, but, okay. But I have to admit, that I knew it was going to be a difficult job because I knew the situation that happened before with Joe Vengloss and the way that actually went. And I knew that Rangers were a stronger team. They had better players. They paid more money. Celtic had Lars and Lambert. We had got good players. And if we maximise our potential, we could compete with Rangers. But Rangers at that time, which is why obviously they're the problems they are now, as you know, we're spending money, paying more salaries, X, Y, Z. So I knew I had no affiliation with Celtic. It's going to be a big risk. And if Sheffield United... And this is not a slight on Celtic once again, because I knew it would have been a much more difficult job Celtic than Sheffield United. I would rather have started at Sheffield United. Less pressure, um, less expectation, and I knew the people there. And I knew that they would have wanted me because they came to me. So when Kenny said, do you want to come to Celtic? I said, okay. So my first day at Celtic, it was quickly made clear to me, which I knew because I'm not an idiot. I'm fairly perceptive. For my first day at Celtic, it became apparent that Kenny Dalglish wanted me at Celtic. No one else. Adam McDonald, CEO, the board, they didn't want me at Celtic. But Kenny insisted, and Kenny's a strong character. He had faith in me. I thank him to this day for that. Nobody else wanted me at Celtic. What a start. I'm at a club where nobody wants me, apart from the manager. But that's fine. That's fine. So, and that's the first day. That's the first day before I even meet the players. Was this, was this a vibe, John, or was something said to you that made it quite clear, or did you just have that intuition? Um, proof. Once again, here we go. Proof. <laughs> yeah. I think you know when somebody doesn't want you. I think you know when somebody doesn't want you. The first week we had a, 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 a shareholders meeting in the stand, which I was very, which, which was so interesting, you know, because of course the fans were the shareholders. So I don't know how many thousands of fans were there. We were on a stage on a microphone. And of course, the first question that came up from one of the shareholders is obviously just a fan. And you have your accountable to the fans was, do you think you should have appointed Mr. Barnes as manager because of his, his, his lack of experience? A few of those questions. So of course that's like, well, it's going to be difficult because I can tell, I can tell no affiliation with Celtic. Here's the rumblings. Alan McDonald said, um, yes, we know Mr. Barnes is inexperienced. We do have faith in him, but be rest assured. Rest assured, and I remember it, and I remember speaking to Kenny after. He said, rest assured that whatever happens, we have Kenny Dalby share. 
That didn't undermine me at all, did it? Mm. That didn't I mean, undermine me. And from that day, from that day, John Barnes was seen as a puppet. Mm. John ba Kenny Dalglish is in charge. John Barnes a puppet. I wanted to rely on Kenny. I wanted to go and talk to Kenny. If I spoke to Kenny, if I had Kenny at the training ground, if I did anything with Kenny, people would be like, Kenny's in charge. You're just a puppet. So this is the first week. Training. We go to training. We go to training. And there are rumblings. There are rumblings. I'm hearing rumblings about, you know, you shouldn't be here. They're not saying it to my face, but I'm hearing it. Terry McDermott's there. I'm hearing it. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Joe Bengloss. Joe Bengloss was there the year before. Joe Bengloss couldn't wait for somebody else to take over. Right. Joe Bengloss has been a manager since 1966. He's managed Czechoslovakia. He's managed Bratislava. He's managed a team to third place in the European Championships. He's an experienced manager. He said that's his most difficult job, that one year at Celtic, because of the characters in the dressing room. The characters in the dressing room. Not now, you have to understand. Remember, 97, 90. I came in 99, 98, 99. Who was there? Fergus McKenna and Jock Brown. Yeah? So how did the players feel about them? We know how the players felt about them. How did the fans feel about them? We know how the fans feel about them. So by the time we had come, they weren't there anymore. But Eric Black was there, who was a fantastic guy, a great coach, because he was brought in to help Joseph Engloss. He was brought in. And Joseph Engloss said, and I'll be fair to Eric, Eric didn't tell us to begin with how the players had treated Joseph Engloss. Mm. Because they didn't like Fergus McGann, they didn't like Jock Brown, a lot to do with money. I don't know how old you are if you remember the situation, when players were on not much money, bad contracts, poor contracts, and they wanted more money. but the club wasn't giving them new contracts because they had three or four years to go. So the club wasn't giving them new contracts. So it was an unhappy dressing room. Right. It was an unhappy dressing room with strong characters, strong characters, Craig Burley, Stubbsy, Stubbsy was fine, um, um, Jonathan Gould, strong characters who weren't happy and who made Joseph Fengloss' life a misery the year before. One of the most experienced managers in the world yeah. who was delighted when he then moved upstairs or whatever it was. So I've come into this situation, and this is my first two weeks. Unhappy players, unhappy players, press before I even played my first game, giving me a hard time. Before I played my first game, giving me a hard time. And I'm like, well, if this is the situation before we've kicked a, a ball, what happens if we lose a couple of matches? I was looking at houses around Sterling. I thought I wanted to live outside Glasgow. Mm -hmm. that's, that's in between Edinburgh and, and Glasgow. I wasn't there long enough to really know the geography of Scotland, to be honest with you, but I think it was in between. And I was looking at fetish school for my kids, and I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to come up to Scotland, fully invest myself up in Scotland, before the first ball was kicked. I'm now divorced, got a new wife with three kids, but my ex-wife and my children, before the first ball was kicked, I was in a flat, and I phoned my wife and I said, don't come, don't come, because I'm not going to be here long. My wife will tell you that, my ex-wife. This is before the first ball is kicked. How could I have that feeling? I'm at a club, great club, great fans. What an opportunity. What is giving me this feeling that this is not going to work? What's giving me that feeling? And we've not kicked a ball yet. So I'm in a flat little guy. We're going preseason. We have an issue. Now, the dream team. And I said, please don't call us a dream team. I'm a first time manager. I've never managed before. I'm not coming here like the cat of a cat with a reputation. I'm going to try my best to do well, but don't think because Barnes, if Barnes was 26 and Dalgish was 25 and we're playing, maybe that'd be different. I'm coming here as a first-time manager. What can I, I'm going to try and work with the players, empower the players, try and get them to do well, but please don't make this a dream team and then build this up to be all of a sudden, you know, we're going to challenge Rangers um, and beat Rangers, which of course we have to do. We have to do, but let's be realistic in what we're doing and not let's get too big-headed and think that because me and Kenny are there now, everything's going to change. So, war chest to spend. I'll tell you. If I'd known Lubo Maravchek, I would not have signed Al Berkovich. Right. I didn't know Lubo. Never heard of Lubo, as most people didn't before um, um, Joseph Engler brought him in. So I'll sign Al Berkovich. Five million pounds. Record signing. Other signings. Olivia Tebeli. A million pounds. Bobby Petter, free transfer. Stylian Petrov, may have been two million pounds. These aren't players, world-class superstar players. They did become that. If you look at what Bobby Petter and Stylian Petrov did at Celtic, but they did become that. But when they came to the club, 
there were youngsters untried. We don't know how they're going to do. This is not spending a war chest and signing senior players. Great players are going to come and, 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 and make Celtic beat Rangers. Berkovich was the big signing. Mm-hmm. And as I said, if I knew how good Luba was, I wouldn't have signed Ayal, but I signed Ayal anyway. Because I knew that in Scotland, if you have a player like Ayal Berkovich or Luba Moravchek or players like Rangers had and Celtic have now, no matter how the game goes, you've got match winners and they can turn the game. So I thought, five million pounds for Ayal, fine. So, the most important thing, which is what Liverpool is showing now, Liverpool isn't better than Man City. Liverpool isn't better than Man United. Liverpool isn't better than Chelsea. You know what, what they have? Haven't got better players. You know what they have? Harmony. They've got harmony. They've got togetherness. That's what they have. Mm-hmm. More harmony than any other club. The players aren't better. They've got more harmony. And from the first week at Celtic, my first week at Celtic, that harmony wasn't there. That harmony wasn't there. So, preseason, we won games. We're doing fine. First game of the season, we go to Aberdeen, 6 0. What a start. I've had problems pre season. I've had problems before with players being not happy, players criticizing. And the most important thing about that was that players, the players I'd signed, there was an agenda, a press agenda. I don't care what you're saying. People may say not. The press in Scotland, as you know, Celtic Rangers, they've got players who they like. They've got players who they like. They've got players who speak to them behind the scenes. Maybe not now anymore. And when Martin O'Neill came, that stopped. But that was happening. So press, press stories were coming out about me before the season started. Mm-hmm. Press stories about Barnes is doing this, Barnes is doing that. Directors were telling me I'm, that players are saying this. I'm saying, well, how do you know? Directors are, players are going above my head to directors to talk about them not being happy. This is before a ball's kicked. Not even give me two or three games to see how it goes. And this is before we played one game. The disharmony, the disharmony, the disunity was rife before the first game. But anyway, I always felt fine because once we get on the pitch, we're going to win matches, everything's going to be okay. First game, 6-0, away at Aberdeen. What a performance. On the way back on the coach, Craig. I work with Craig Burley now. Not now, I work with him about four or five years ago at ESPN. Yeah. I get on well with Craig. You know Craig is not a happy person. We know what Craig is like. Craig wasn't happy because Craig wasn't playing. Why Craig wasn't playing was because he was injured from the season before. He was injured all preseason. He just managed to play, not even play, he managed to train at the end of the season. But because this is the new, exciting Celtic, new team, he wants to be a part of it. He's not fit. He's not ready. He's on the bench and he doesn't get on. Against Aberdeen, we win 6-0. It's a long coach journey, as you know, Aberdeen to, to back to Celtic. Shouting at the back, abusing, after, stand-up rows, came into the office. That night, we got back at 2 o'clock in the morning, I want to see you. Craig says to me, going to the office, what's the matter? You're trying to get rid of me at the club. You know, blah, blah, blah. This is what, and all the players, this is what they're saying. Some of the players, because Craig's a powerful character. Craig is a strong character. He is the leader in the dressing room. And if Craig's not happy, that's what happens. This is the first game. We won 6-0. What a happy day. What a happy day. And this is what we're going through. This is what we're going through. So, so, and this continued throughout. And I thought, it's okay. It's okay. This is going to happen. I couldn't speak to players. Bobby Petter, Stidia Petrov, scared to play. Scared to play because the fans who like their favourites are booing them. Bobby Petter was getting booed when I picked him. Stidia Petrov was getting booed. They couldn't play. I'd signed them. I want to put them on. The crowd were against them because the crowd had their favourites. The press were against them because the press split the, the, the team into the players I'd signed, who they didn't like and they were criticising, to the players who were there before, who were strong, who were powerful, who were members of the press. And this is all after one game. You know the the point you made there about Craig Borley. I was going to bring that up because you're talking about a lack of harmony, John. And I, from the outside looking in, having not been in a dressing room like yourself, I'm thinking, well, do you not bring in some new blood? And then if there are any bad apples, for want of a better expression, that might change it. Did you believe you could turn it around by changes in personnel? Playing personnel? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like if Craig Burley's causing problems. First of all, well, first of all, the problem we had was as much as we spent five million pounds on Neil Berkovich, we weren't about to spend more money on anybody else. That is why when Henrik broke his leg, which I'll come to in a minute, we couldn't sign anybody. That's why Ian Wright came on a free transfer at 36 years old to be a, 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 bit, a bit part player because we had Mark Burchley who could play. So when you talk about money, that's the thing. Dream team, money to spend. There wasn't money to spend. Not only wasn't there money to spend, I said to them before preseason started, no, sorry, during preseason, first week of the season, I said, listen, the disharmony amongst the players, yeah, the disharmony amongst the players is a lot to do with the fact that lots of players, and remember the financial situation the year before with bonuses and stuff like that, was a financial one. So Henrik had signed a new contract. 
I don't know, 20 grand a week, whatever. We have to get people on side. No one's getting new contracts. We managed to give Paul Lambert a new contract. So players understood that these players are getting this. We're not. So, so we're not happy. Mark Viduka. I forgot to tell you about Mark Viduka. Mark Viduka is a fantastic player and a lovely boy. Lovely boy. Mark's a great kid. When I came, I heard about Mark Viduka. He ran away to Australia, went back to Australia, had a bit of a nervous breakdown. So Adam McDonald said, listen, we've got this player, Mark Viduka. He's got to come back. So can I bring him, I bring him in Australia, speak to him, Mark. You know, you're a great player. We love you. You come back. Everything is going to be great. So he comes back. He comes back. And when he comes back, and the way we're playing, Aberdeen, 6-0. St. Johnson next game, 3-0. A new, exciting team. You've got Moravchek and Berkovic making goals for Henrik and, and, and Viduka. Not So Mark is delighted. Mark's happy. We're playing well. Everything is going well. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to chronologically do it. I, I always go from flip to flip from moment to moment. I want to talk about football for a little bit. 4-2-2-2. 4 2 2 So I then said, they put up on this thing. They want to play like Brazil. Blah, 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 blah. I looked at the team. And as I said, had I not known about Luba, I would have had Al. I would have had Lars Lubaduka up front, Luba behind him. Three midfield players, Burley, Vikors, Malby, whichever the three midfield players are back for. Once Berkovic came for five million and I saw how good Luba was, I had to play both of them. I had to play both of them. But of course, you're going to also have to play Henrik and Mark Viduka. Yeah? And you're going to have two midfield players. Because I, I always felt, like what Liverpool are doing now, is that you get your width from your fullbacks. Why have Lubo and Al playing as wingers? You want them to play infield because that's where they're going to cause damage. You want them to play behind the strikers. So if they play behind one striker, who's Mark Maduka, with Henrik playing deeper, which means that Henrik is right behind Mark Maduka, they're either side of Henrik, which is not out wide, it then becomes a 4-2-3-1. And a lot of people play that now. However, what that needs is two defensive midfield players. Because if you've got Moravchek, Berkovic, Larson, Vaduka, you've got to get Jackie McNamara and Stefan Maher, whoever's playing that back, attacking. You've got two centre-backs. And if you have another midfield player who's going to attack as well, we have to be respectful to the league that we're in and the team we have. That's two central defenders defending and one holding midfield player. That's not good enough. So therefore, I wanted two holding midfield players. Mm -hmm. And I wanted Craig Burley to be one of them. It's always going to be Paul Lambert. Then we had Martin V. Course, you had Johan Melby. When Craig got fit, as he, as he was going to get fit, but Craig didn't want to be a holding midfield player. He wanted to attack and score goals. And I would say to him, Craig, I'm going to play you. If you're a good player, I want you to play, but you have to be disciplined to play as a holding midfield player. I don't want to do that because he wants to attack. And that is why we had our defensive problems. That's why we scored a lot of goals, but we conceded goals. If we had two holding midfield players, we would. Culminating to, I remember, I think we beat St. Johnson 4 0 at home. I can't remember. And Craig scored a goal. I don't know if you remember it. Google it. Craig Johnson, because of course, every now and again he could go forward. And he go forward, he scored a goal by making a run as an attacking midfield player. When really he's playing as a holding midfield player. But it was an easy game. And when he scored that goal, you saw the anger on his face because this is what he felt he should be doing every week. He came running, shouting and swearing and pointing at me when he had scored a goal instead of being happy because he wanted to make the point that this is what I should be doing. And I said, Craig, because of the way we want to play, okay, I can play you there, but I'll have to leave Duba or Al out, which I'm not going to do, or Mark or, or Viduko. So that's not what I'm going to do. So a lot of this thing about the way you played and X, Y, Z and stuff like that, that's fine. The disharmony, the disunity, the way we're actually playing, I couldn't speak to players. I'm the manager. The worst thing about my whole experience in Celtic, I'll tell you what it is. When this narrative came out about me from before we kicked the first ball, I'm arrogant and aloof. Mm. I read it again today. And fans are saying that on Twitter. You were too arrogant and aloof. Nobody knows me. I had my first six years at Watford with Graham Taylor talking about the essence of the team, the community. The most important thing is the, the family, the community, the fans, everybody together. Went to Liverpool, same thing. This is where I've been brought up. To be humble, I think humility is the greatest quality a human being can have. And that is why I'm on Twitter arguing with some idiots because I'm not going to be aloof and arrogant and say, I'm, I can't argue with you. I can't talk to you. I'm, a, I'm better than you because I'm, I've never been like that ever in my life. And that hurt me more than anything else. Call me a bad manager, call me whatever. And that was a narrative. So of course, Celtic fans, you ask young kids, never met me. People never met me. What's Barnes like? He's too arrogant and aloof because they read it in the newspaper. Unconscious. Unconscious. Never mind unconscious, but unconscious conditioning. Mm -hmm. 
So that was the narrative at Celtic. So while I'm at Celtic, I couldn't speak to the players because what happened was I'm now, listen, if I go to a party, I can tell you, I'm the life and soul of the party. I'll rap, I'll sing, I'll dance, I'll meet people, I'll talk to everybody. That's who I am. I'm not arrogant and aloof, but that's the story. Barnes is arrogant and aloof. Secondly, let me go on, because you have to engage with the players. You see Jurgen Klopp hugging the players, talking to the players? Because the dressing room was split to the people who weren't happy and the strong characters who may not have wanted me there. If I went to the dressing room to try and talk to players and talk to them, players who may have wanted to talk to me, because Barnes is all right, let's go and talk to him. They were afraid to. Because what would their teammates have said? Because they were being traitors. Mm -hmm. Because they're sucking up to the manager. So I remember going to talk to players and then all of a sudden, as I'm talking to them, I can feel, oh, can I prove it? I'm sorry, I can't prove it. Anyway, as I'm talking to them, I can feel that they're not being as engaging with me. Mm -hmm. Other players are around. And when I talk to them by themselves with no one else, they get on fine. All of them, Vaduk, everybody. But as soon as the group's there, it's as if the BDIs are watching and the mafia are going to have a go at you because what you're talking to the manager for. This is from the first week in training. This is the first week in training. So, as I said, always, I'm not bothered because we're going to win football matches. Yeah. We're going to win football matches. And that's the most important thing. So, these are all the problems I'm having as we're going through. Then, I fast forward. First 11 games, we'd lost one or two. We'd scored lots of goals. And the thing about it is that not just the press, you speak to the managers. Bobby Williamson, what a lovely guy he was. He was my favorite manager because I went to the room, I spoke to him, and at least he wanted to speak to the other managers. They never invited me in. They never wanted to talk to me because they felt I shouldn't be there. Eddie Scott now, Aberdeen's manager, great manager, Scandinavian manager. First game of the season, beat them 6-0. Yeah. First game of the season, away. In the papers the next day, Eddie Scott now, what do you think about something? Oh, they're a bit naive. You know, I think that the Gabbacath and Rangers are stronger. Barnes, inexperience. I said, we just beat you 6-0 away. Eddie Scott now. Second game, we played Aberdeen. 7-0. 7 Yep. Barnes. Oh, Rangers are a better team. Barnes, naive. He can't play this way because people are going to score against him. Third game against Aberdeen, 5-0. Barnes, not sure because, you know, they're too open. So you have managers saying that. That's going to influence people. You have the press. You have the press saying, David Proven. I'll tell you, David Proven and me had a big problem. I don't know why. I didn't know David, never met him. But of course, David Proven has allies in the club. He was a big friend of Craig Burley's. The press of allies. So from my first, and I don't know this until I get there. And Joseph Vengos said to me, from, from the first two weeks, he said, you're going to have a problem with certain players. I didn't know what he meant. Didn't know what he meant. I'm going to have a problem with certain players. So this is all going on when first 12 games are doing all right. Yeah, okay, we lost one, but we're scoring lots of goals. We're conceding goals, but we can work on that. Um, then all of a sudden, Henry Klaassen breaks his leg against Lyon. Henry Clarkson breaks his leg against Leon. Uh, then on the Saturday, Paul Lambert against Rangers breaks his jaw. You may remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Our two most influential players. And when I talk about the dressing room, those two were fantastic. Regardless of what they thought, I really don't know. I'm a good friend of Paul's now, actually. I work with him in Qatar, and I speak to Paul every now and again, and I see him. And, but what I said about Paul, even then, even then, before they even knew me, they were professionals. Regardless of whether they thought it was good or not, whatever, they did what's right for the team. They worked for the team. If I asked them to do something, they would do it. They wouldn't complain. I remember Henrik switching positions once with, off his own volition, with, with AL against Hibbs. He was having a problem man-marking when he said, AL, I'll go and play out wide and he'll come with me and you can play out of it. Henrik may or may not have liked me, I don't know. I mean, I don't know why he wouldn't because I'm a lovely person. <laughs> but in terms of the way I got on with people, but what they did, regardless of how they felt, but they did the right thing. So those two were fantastic. Once I lost those two, it was always going to be difficult. It was always going to be difficult. So Henry Clarkson breaks his leg. Mark Viduka ran away to, to Australia the year before. He's come back. He's happy. Mark's scoring goals. He's the top scorer. We're playing so well. Yes, we're three, four points behind Rangers, but we're attacking. We're playing well. This is before Henry breaks his, Henry breaks his leg. Henry breaks his leg. And then on the Monday, Mark Viduka comes in he wants a new contract or he wants to leave the football club. I went, what do you mean? He said, because Adam McDonald said to him, the chief executive said to him, when he had a bit of a nervous breakdown, went back to Australia, that come back, play, and if you're not happy, you can go. If you're not happy, you can leave the club for four million pounds, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So, which we didn't know. So we went to, me and Kelly went to Alan McDonald and we said, Alan, is this true? That this is what 
you said to Mark. He goes, yeah, yeah, but there's nothing in writing. I said, it doesn't matter if it's in writing. You say to Mark Viduka, as much as he's Australian, he's Croatian, his mentality, you're going to, you lose him. You lose him. So we said to him, Mark, wh why aren't you happy? You're top scorer. You're playing well. Everything's going well. Why aren't you happy? I'm just not happy. Because his contract wasn't great. Don't forget when he came from Croatia, Zagreb. The only reason he came to Celtic was because Celtic paid the money up front. The Spanish clubs interested. They wouldn't have paid the money and he, he would have gone to a Spanish club. But he came to Celtic because they paid the money up front and he had to. In Croatia, when they tell you to go somewhere, you go somewhere. So Mark, that's why he had his problems. So now Mark's not happy. We haven't got Henry Glasson. We haven't got, we've lost Mark. Mark's head's gone. So we've got young Mark Burchill. So we're going to play Burchill. Fine. But it doesn't matter because he's not a happy Mark Paduka. We can still play. We can still do matches. So Henry's broken his leg. Paul Lammers now out. Never played for me again. Christmas comes. I don't know. We're six points behind Rangers. But it was okay. We lost a couple of games, but that's okay. We go on mid-season break. Christmas. You know, you have a break over Christmas. Yeah. We go to Portugal. We go on a team bonding exercise that was the worst team bonding exercise you would ever see the players were so unhappy Luba was rooming with Mark Faduka so of course what Mark is talking about new contract he wants to leave things aren't happening Luba how much money are you on Luba was on peanuts because when Luba came to Celtic Ben Gloss knew what a great player he was so he signed a contract at 31 years old whatever it is for no money but a four-year contract Luba turns out with the best in the world but he's on no money be like Scotty Pippen at, at, at Boston Celtics. So Lubo and Mark, so Lubo is now not happy because Lubo, you should be on this, you should be on more. So mm -hmm. the team bottling exercise, arguing throughout the whole week in Portugal, comes back, Lubo's not happy. And I said to them, listen, either pay them all the same or don't because players are now not happy. So from a team bonding exercise, for us to be happy, everybody's now unhappy. Mm -hmm. Everybody's now unhappy. So we've now come back in January and it's like, well, okay, here we go again. Aren't going to be happy. Things getting out in the press. Barnes is aloof. Barnes is arrogant. The fans hate him because he's aloof and arrogant. Nothing to do with, this has got nothing to do with my color. This has got nothing to do with my race. John Barnes, a person, is aloof and arrogant. Players hate him because he thinks he's better than everybody else, which I have never been from as a five-year-old boy till I was a 30. So I must have been aloof and arrogant for those six months. Then when I came back from Scotland and I started to be normal with everybody else, uh, that narrative was gone. I just had an eight-month period. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I just... Um, had a bit of a, a, a thing where I just wanted to be aloof and arrogant um, there. Um, so anyway, so we've come back. Players aren't happy. Things are going on. Faduka wants to leave. Moravchek's not happy. Larson's out. La um, 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 Lambert's broken his jaw. Bobby Petter can't play because every time he gets the ball, the crowd boo him. Stidian Petrov should never be playing for Celtic. And if you remember the press about Stidian, Stidian Petrov, you know, when I played him, and I knew I wanted to play Stylian Petrov as one of the midfield players because I knew Stylian would do the job as a holding midfield player. As much as he can attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just saw him as an attacking midfield player when, when, you know, when Kenny took over and with Martin O'Neill. Because I remember the first time I met Stylian Petrov, I was so impressed with him. A young boy from Bulgaria, could hardly speak English. I met him up at a hotel and I said to him, Stylian, I brought the thing out. This is how I want you to play. No problem. That's all he said. I said, I know you want to be an attacking midfield player, but we got, we got Lambert. Sorry, we got, I want you to play alongside Paul Lambert because we have you know, Marafchek, and we have Berkovic, and we've got Vaduka, we've got lots of attacking players. I know you want to attack, but he said, no problem, I can do that. I'll do that. So if you ask him to play right back, he'll do it. If you ask him to play center, center holding the midfield player, ask him to play, and that's the kind of player you want, someone who'll play for the team. But he couldn't, because as soon as you put him on the pitch, he got the ball, the crowd booed him, because of the agenda against Emil Petrov. Martin O'Neill came, brought everything together. Yep. Brought everything together. Bobby Petter, how great was he? Stylian Petrov, how great was he? So were they not great before? Or because there was people against them, when I tried to support them, there were players against them. I remember players saying to me, what is, what is he? I'm not going to mention names. He shouldn't even be here. I'm better than him. I said to a player, when he asked why he wasn't playing, and I said, well, you know, Stylian Petrov isn't even playing. Don't even call his name in the same, as, in the same breath as mine. I'm not even going to tell you which player said that. This is what they're saying to me, because I had signed them. Yeah. Maybe Olivier Tebeli may not have worked out, so that didn't work out, but that happens to everybody. And I thought he was an okay player. But he wasn't coming here to win us the league. He'd cost a million pounds from Sheffield United. Stubbsy, you know, had been injured or whatever. So, you know, and, and then I'm getting criticised for Stefan Bonnet, a young French boy who would sign for maybe in five years' time to be good for Celtic. Oh, why did he sign Stefan Bonnet? I've been criticised for, for Ian Wright. I didn't sign We had Ian Wright because we couldn't get anybody else to replace Henrik and we needed a bit of a goal scorer. So this is, and these are, so from day one, 
until leading up to Rangers. Then all of a sudden, the Inverness can actually fit this game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's so much other things that I can I can talk about in terms of the 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 directors pulling me up to 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 tell me about what I should be doing when I think about and telling me things that are happening at the club behind the scenes, what players are saying, and I'm like, well, who told you that? She, um, she, um, they were saying uh, uh, um, the, 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 the kit man I went hang on a second the players I've been talking to them you know they're my two favourite players at Celtic sorry my two favourite people at Celtic apart from Kenny Angie yes. and John Clark yep. I spent all of my time with them players couldn't talk to me because other players may see them mm-hmm. There's no, I could go up and have a cup of tea with Kenny but none of the directors had, had, had no relationship with them because they weren't interested in me even being there. But of course, they put up with it for Kenny. So I never had that relationship with them. Even some of the staff, as good, good, good as they were, because of course, the staff were friendly with the players. They were there all together. And when all of a sudden, this thing about John Barnes, John Barnes, John Barnes, nobody could speak to me if other people were looking. When I spoke to the staff or other players individually, they were all fine because, as I said, I'm a nice person. I don't care what people say. But when other people were around, they could speak to me. So where I used to go is downstairs from the office, down pit side, where you have the, the, the laundry room where Angie was and John mm-hmm. Clark were. And I'd sit mm-hmm. in there with them and I'd talk to them. And I'd have cups of tea with them and I'd have coffee with them. That's how arrogant I am. Sit down there and we'd have a laugh. We'd make fun of each other. We'd have a laugh with Clarky, with Angie. I'd go down there for an hour and sit and talk to them. They're the only people I could talk to because nobody saw them. And because nobody saw them talking to me. No. Nobody saw them because everybody else was gone. So that's fine. Yeah, and this yeah. was my experience at Celtic. It's quite sad to hear this, John, because obviously you're talking about a narrative, and a narrative does uh, make people believe certain scenarios, like you're saying there that you're this aloof character. But there's obviously there's bad influences in that dressing room. At any point, I mean, the makeup of your partnership, if you like, with Kenny being a technical director, football director, and you as the head coach. When you spoke to Kenny, was there any advice? I mean, you've obviously tried a team bonding session, taking them away in the winter break, that kind of thing. You've brought in new players. It sounds from the outside looking in that everything you're trying is is just not working. Did Kenny give you any advice? Or did you think at any point yourself, I've, I've got to get out of this? Because it sounds as though you are trying to adapt and it's almost an unwinnable situation. I said to my wife before the first game, don't come up, I won't be here long. I won't be here long. So what then happened just before, yeah, Henry broke his leg. Things started to go a little bit worse than it was in terms of the disharmony and people aren't being happy. Then I had a meeting with um, some of the directors and I was then told what could, and I knew this would have been just a delaying tactic, what could help to make people feel happier, to get them. I said, what can we do to, because the players aren't happy. What we could do, sack Eric Black. I went, what? They went, sack Eric Black. I went, why? They said, well, Eric is seen as a Jock Brown man. When Jock Brown broke in Joe Venglas, because Eric spoke French and Joe's English wasn't great, they brought Eric in. So they didn't like Jock, they didn't like Fergus, so therefore they don't like Eric because he's seen as a Jock Brown man. Mm -hmm. Now, that's interesting because when I came to Celtic, Eric Black was there. I formed a relationship with Eric Black. He's one I would speak to. Maybe because he didn't mind because they didn't, he knew they didn't like him anyway. So he knew they didn't like him. I did not know they didn't like Eric. I did not know they didn't like Eric. And that's testament to Eric Black. And I'll tell you why. Because Eric had seen, and after this all came out, when I had this conversation with Eric, Eric had seen the way they had treated Joe Bengloss. He had seen the players who had stabbed Joe Bengloss in the back and who wouldn't play for Joe Bengloss and who was undermining the authority of the hierarchy. And Eric never said a word to me when I came. Never said a word to me. Eric doesn't know me. He doesn't know that if he comes to me and he says, those players and those players and those players, I don't know Eric Black. I can go to the players and say, when Eric is saying this, he knows they don't like him. Eric never said a word. But the players didn't know that. The players assumed that Eric was bad-mouthing them to me. Mm-hmm. So therefore, they thought that, so when all of a sudden I said, why sack Eric Black? Because, you know, they don't like him, blah, blah, blah. And I said to them, if, when I came to this club, if Eric Black wasn't here, not a problem. When I came to this club, if after one week, Eric was here, but then he said, make a change, what? no problem. I don't know Eric Black. I said, I've known Eric Black now for six months. And Eric Black is an honorable, ethical man who didn't even let me know 
how bad the players were in previously trying to undermine the situation before because he wanted me to make my own mind up. And you're saying to me now that I'm a psychiatric black because then maybe that will help me in terms of my relationship with the players because they thought that me and Eric were then talking about the behind the back when Eric never told me at all. And that's credit to Eric Black because he said, what, and I said, Eric, I didn't know this was going on. I didn't know that he had this relationship with them. I could see from a coaching perspective when he spoke and when I spoke that they were just like, I thought it was me. Mm. You know, when the players weren't responding at all because Eric was the first team coach. So when Eric was doing things and they were like, oh, and he heard murmurings and whisperings, I thought, flipping hell, poor Eric. They don't like me, so Eric has to pay the, the price because he's the coach. And I realized they didn't like him either. So between me and Eric, and we are the coach, the, the manager or the head coach and the first team coach, and the players don't like us, the press don't like us, the fans don't because of this. And I said, I'm not sacking Eric Black. And I knew because maybe I've done that. And if I've done that, it would have been a stay of execution for, I don't know, another three or four months, weeks, whatever, a year. But I would not do that. I would not do that. See, when you're you're talking about Alan McDonald, for example, and, and you've got a, sounds like a toxic uh, element in the changing room, John, the way that you're describing it. Um, I, I'm thinking about Craig, Craig Burley, who obviously played a big part under Vim Janssen a couple of years before you came in. Surely you get rid of Craig Burley. Surely Eric Black isn't the guy you're looking to get rid of. And of course, there was an opportunity for Craig to, to leave. Did you feel that... Popular. Craig was popular, not in the dressing room, but with the directors, because we remember the Wim Janssen years when he was great. But the year before, when he was injured, he wasn't. Now, the situation was, I played Craig Burley every single time. So mm -hmm. when you talk about Craig was saying, you want to get rid of me, and David Crowe was his mate, and he's going, why are you not playing Craig? I said, I, Craig played every single time when he was fit. But I wanted to play as a holding midfield player. And he played, but he still wasn't happy. Even when we had won, and because he didn't score or whatever, and he wasn't playing the way he wanted, he was still, Craig, they call him Al McTatlock anyway, because anyone knows Craig, and, and, and this is said with love, because I do get on well with Craig now. And even now, when you get on well with Craig, and I work with him on TV, he's miserable. We know Craig is miserable. So it's not as if Craig's going to be the happiest person. So that wasn't the issue. That wasn't the issue. I just wanted him, and I didn't expect him to be any different in terms of being happy and whatever, because that's not who Craig is. But he's subservient to the team, as Henry Glasson was. Regardless of the way you see Henry Larson, Henry Larson was a team player. We look at him as a superstar, and yes, he is. But his first responsibility is to the team. And that is the way I was brought up. That's the way everybody's brought up. So, so and, and these were the issues that were happening. So Craig was happy because Derby gave him more than twice what he was on at Celtic, and Celtic wouldn't. And that was not my fault. I, didn't, I said to the board, please, you'll make my life so much easier. Give them all big contracts, new contracts, and then they'll be happy. So they weren't. And I couldn't come out and say, Oh, um, the club aren't giving it, the players aren't happy, but it's not my fault because I, you know, um, I, I'm saying to the board, pay them the money. I can't tell the board to pay them money. I don't know anything about finances. I don't know, but I know that players have got contracts. They signed the contracts. They're not happy. They want more money. We have to bring Berkovich up on that money. Larson signed for that money. Then Lambert is the only other one. And after that, other players have contracts. So they're not happy, but I've got to then deal with that. The board don't have to deal with the consequences of me not keeping the players happy. I do. And I can't then say, oh, it's the board's fault because the players aren't happy, they want more money, they're not giving it to them. So I'm saying, well, you know, the harmony is not great, but it's because of it. So I'm making excuses as to why the harmony isn't great. I'm making excuses to finally, the last day against Inverness Cal Cali Thistle, coming to that point now, yes, we're going to turn it around. Because, of course, if the harmony is okay and there's no fighting in the dressing room at halftime and everybody's happy, maybe we can turn it around. But at halftime, and this is where I don't necessarily blame Mark Viduka, because Mark is a, a volatile character. And I remember when foreign players started coming into England, or Scotland, I'm sure, is the same thing. And you have to be careful how you speak to them. You know, if you're a Scottish or English player, you can call them anything and say anything to them. And if don't take it personally, it's not an insult to get on with it. If you never fight, but you get on with it. You have to be very careful how you speak to people if they're from. I remember Graham Sooners telling me when he's in Turkey that he said something during the training, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, the player turned up with his agent in the chairman's room because Graham Taylor, had, sorry, um, Graham Sooners had swore at him. He got summoned to the, the owner's, the, the, the chairman's office with the player and an agent and the player was crying because in training, Graham has swore at him. So I understand you have to. So at halftime, Mark was accused. But he wasn't accused because in a team talk at halftime when things aren't going well, Eric Black said to him, Mark, you're not even trying. That's all he said. Mark, you're not even trying. Mark jumped up. You're calling me a cheat. You're calling me a cheat. No one speaks to me like that. Went for him, called out, took his kit off. I went, Mark, what are you doing? He says, I'm not playing. I said, you're not going to go out and play. He said, no, I'm not playing. I said, okay, righty, get on. So all of this was going on. 
And all throughout this, all throughout this, you're talking about the press, but in a situation where we had our own and every club has its own publication and there was the Celtic View. And from day one, the Celtic View were being critical of me and Kenny in terms of things we were doing. And we had a, 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 a meeting with, with Alan McDonald about that. And he said that we don't want to be seen to be too biased. And I said, no, 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 that's the whole point. Your publication should be biased towards you if things aren't going well. But the publication itself was criticizing me and that forms a lot of people's opinion. That's where the arrogance comes from, as much as it's going to come from the press, you know, because the press may have their agenda. But our own publication was, was selling this narrative about John Barnes being arrogant and aloof and egotistical, which, you know, was crazy. So uh, as much as, you know, I would have problems with the press, when you have problems with your own publication, um, that makes it even more difficult. So you've got all of this as a backdrop, John. You are standing in that changing room. And there's one other thing I'm going to ask you previous to the Inverness Cali game, but you came up to that. I'm, I'm looking at your career. You've played top flight football. You've played in World Cup finals. Have you ever seen a situation where a player has refused to go back out into the second half and play? Is this the first time? I mean, that sounds absolutely absurd. Never, never. And then after that, after we've lost, we've gone in, got down McDonald, and I said to him, I've got to go and see the press. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? Don't say he refused to play. Don't say refuse to play because we need happy news around Celtic. PLC, you can't say players are refusing to play, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I'm going to get absolutely criti- crucified. He said, don't worry about it. He said, listen, we lost the Inverness Cali Thistle. And you know what would have happened after the Inverness Cali Thistle game? We would have gone to play against who we had and, you know, we would have won some games. We would have lost, but we would have gone back and won because we have great players, so we'll win. It's not like every game is going to be hard. And then, you know, if it goes well in the next month, um, Yes, we're disappointed about Cali Thistle. So we'll ride that out because we're going to win the next game, win the next game. They're not going to forget about it. But after you score four goals in the next game, everything's going to be fine. So don't say that Mark Viduka refused to play and we'll ride the storm out. This is on, was it on a Saturday, the game or Sunday? I think it was a Saturday. Whatever it was. But we're going to ride the game, ride the storm out. I said, okay, went back up. Never said Mark Viduka refused to play. It's disappointing. You know, the team, we didn't play well. Congratulations. No, 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 no. Coming to training the next day. It might have been a midweek match. Coming to training the next day, nine o'clock, players are off. I'm in the office. Kenny comes in, has a little chat. Um, nothing is said. I'm there till about four o'clock. I'm driving home to Mulgai, my little flat in Mulgai right by the fast station. Loved it. Nice little Italian restaurants there. I've been at the club all day. No one said a word to me. Kenny came in, had a cup of tea. Not one person said a word to me about anything. And the day before, we're going to ride it out. Players are, fans are disappointed. We're going to ride it out. I've been in to see um, Anna McDonald and, 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 or the hierarchy or whatever you've said and, and, and then I got a phone call about two hours later, you're sacked. John, see, when you're in a situation where you're at the club all day, Kenny Dalglish, who he's been your manager, he's your manager at Liverpool, he's your manager at Newcastle, did Kenny know? Had he even, even been told? Kenny didn't know. Kenny didn't know. So Kenny's the one who phoned me after that. Kenny didn't know that that had happened. Obviously, whoever had phoned Kenny after that, for Kenny to phone me. So Kenny then phoned me after. But I've been there all day. And to be find, it, found, find out on Sky that steps will be taken, I don't know what that meant, but I, of course I didn't find out what that meant, uh, with no one coming in to talk to me about anything. When the, night, the day before, when the game was on, and I said, what are we going to say about Mark Viduka? What are we going to say about the game? When they say what happened and why did Mark Viduka come out into the second half? Um, we'll write that out. Don't worry. Good news. Don't, don't say anything uh, to one day later. And I can tell you, and I can tell you now, Celtic is a great football club. Great fans, great history, great tradition. Great fans, great people, great club. We know the geography of Celtic Park. We know where it is. We know where it is. You come up from England, you come to the end of the motorway, you drive a little bit, there is Celtic Park in the south. I drove from Mulgai, went to the ground, did what I had to do. Within 10 minutes, I'm on that motorway, driving down to England for the last time. In my life, I've never felt more relieved. In my life, I have never felt more relieved. And you're the second manager in succession who felt that way because Joe Vengloss told you that he was it was the worst job he had ever had. It's sad from a Celtic fan's perspective that the situation at the club was so bad at that time, John. And when you're talking about the Viduka situation... Same thing about that. Why, did, why was it? Because they'd won the league the year before, two years before, so within one year of when Joe Benglos came, when they were league champions, 
to the second year, I don't understand how things could rapidly have declined. I'm not talking about whether I was a crap manager or Joseph Engler's not a good manager. I'm talking about the harmony mm-hmm. of a club who had won the league the year before. And I understand the situation whereby if Rangers are up, Celtic has to be down. And if Celtic are up, Rangers has to be down, as we've seen. But the clubs were very similar at that time. Of course, Celtic, because of what happened to Rangers, were, you know, in the last 10 years or whatever, it's not been equal. It's obvious. But at that time, while Rangers were spending more money and you had Fran Bronkers and Claudio Reina and Jorg Alberts and Michael Moles and Ronald De Boer, I mean, they, were, they, had much, they had better players. End of story. End of story. And I always felt if we could keep our best 11 fit and motivated, I didn't think we'd win the league that first year. I felt they've got a bigger squad, a better squad, but if we could keep our best 11 fit, we'd be able to compete with them. Last and Lambert got injured, fine, and we had our problems. But I always felt that this was going to be a, a long-term situation because I knew we'd finish second. And if you finish second, and you can build, and you can build, and you can build. But as I said, from the first week at the club, I knew that I wouldn't be there long. After Inverness, Kylie John, you didn't resign. Uh, you were going about your business. Do you think you could have turned it round? And what I mean by turn it round is to... Perhaps, I know the club went on to win the League Cup, for example. Could you have turned around that dressing room? No. No. Because if you look at, if you look at the narrative at that time about me from the press, from players, from the fans, because the fans had already been influenced. The fans had been influenced so early. From the 6-0 against Aberdeen, when everything is supposed to be okay, the press from the 3-0 against St. Johnson after that, we lost the third game, but we went on to win the next three. And for the first 10 games, I was getting, as you will say in Scotland, pelters. And I thought to myself, if I'm getting pelters now, when we're doing okay, what's going to happen if you go through a bit of a sticky patch? And once you are now in that rut, how am I going to turn it around? How is John Barnes not going to be arrogant and aloof anymore? Because that's what people think I am. How is that going to happen? Because people already made their minds up that I was arrogant and aloof. I was egotistical. So how can I turn that around? Particularly when those people who didn't want me there in the first place and who had agendas against me in the press from day one, they were never going to change their minds. David Corbyn was never, ever going to change his mind about me. Ever. No matter what I'd done. If I'd won the league, it would be about Larson and Lambert and the players. And when we lose, it's because of me. And that was always going to be the case. The only way I could have turned it around is if I continued to win. Because let me tell you, Sir Alex Ferguson, I would say, is not particularly popular with the Manchester United players because he's winning every single week. They haven't got a choice. How many times do you see a manager when they say, how's a great manager and everybody loves him, then he starts to lose and then he loses his job and they say, oh, well, we didn't like him anyway and start to then talk about him. So if I was then going to win all the time, it didn't matter whether players liked me or not. But that was never going to happen. So... I can say Celtic were right to sack me, which I've said. Celtic were right to sack me because I could never have turned it around. Mm-hmm. And the whole Twitter thing, I'll finish where I started, it is not about me being sacked by Celtic and they should not have sacked me. And it's not about me being as good as any Celtic manager. It's not about that. Because, I, Celtic were, because that situation was never going to be resolved. And in many respects, even when Kenny left the next year and then Martin O'Neill came in, Martin O'Neill came in when all of a sudden everything was positive. Not only, not only was everything positive, he insisted and he got something. Yeah. Hartson. These are players, proven players. This is not Tebeli and, and, and Petra and Petrov, who nobody heard of. They then started to get better players than Rangers straight away. He had a staff with him. He brought a staff with him mm-hmm. who then, because if you bring a staff with you, there can be no dissent because you're all in together. The staff will then know who the dissenters are. You can get rid of the dissenters, even members of staff who may be dissenters. So it's okay when you say Martin O'Neill came in and he got everybody together and John Barnes didn't do that. John Barnes wasn't able to do that. John had and I'm a nicer per- I can tell you, I'm a nicer person than Martin O'Neill. I can tell you. <laughs> Although Martin's a lovely guy. <laughs> can I just ask you though, John, um, again, as a Celtic fan, uh, I would like to know, have you ever been back? Have you ever come back up to Celtic Park? Absolutely. I've been up to watch games. I've worked up there for Sky and I've worked up there. And every time I see people, I go and I hug them, people who I know and people who know me. But unfortunately, 99% of people don't know you. They just know what they have been conditioned to think about you. Mm-hmm. And that is why on Twitter, Celtic fans, you're too arrogant. You're too arrogant. 
And I said, well, how, why, how am I even talking to you? When I'm, when you're a bit of an idiot, but I'm not going to insult you. But I'm engaging with you. Do you think anybody who loves you and somebody who is um, one of your heroes would even give you the time of day to even talk to you? I'm going to ask you a question about uh, one of you, the players that came in under your tenure. And it was interesting that you mentioned on Twitter um, that you didn't, you didn't sign him. You didn't have the say in Rafael coming over from Brazil. It, it stands up as one of the most bizarre signings in our in our history, John. What was the story? And with a name like that, with a name like that is not a great thing. I mean, you talk about the two greatest headlines, two greatest headlines in footballing history anywhere in the world: Super Cali go ballistic Celtic or atrocious, and Barnes signed shite. <laughs> <laughs> and you had nothing to do with that signing. So all of a sudden, we're a huge club. We want to make a big signing. We want to sign this Brazilian. Never heard of him. We can get him for four or five million, whatever it is. I don't know him. If you're telling me we're going to sign him, because my thing was, I'm going to coach the players. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to sign a player, he must be a good player. He's come from Gremio. He's been Brazilian national team. He must be a good player. I've never seen him. I don't know him. But he must be a good player, I should imagine. So if you sign him, I will coach him. But if you're asking me whether I want to have him, I can't say yes because I've never seen him. I've never seen him. But it was a coup for Celtic. Don't forget, Rangers are spending money signing players. We can sign a Brazilian international? Please. Never mind, no one's heard of him. That's going to be a big coup for the club. So I said, okay, sign him. Sign him. So they signed him. And of course, appendix out straight away. I don't know what it's like as a player. But any player coming into the club at that time was never going to be successful. Because any player coming to the club, because I had signed him, is going to be criticised. I've had Bobby Petter crying in the office, crying tears in the office because I mean, the fans I... were turning against him. Crying tears, Bobby mm-hmm. Petter. Mm-hmm. And I look at the players, I said, which one of you players are protecting Bobby Petter, your teammates? Stigan Petrov, the same thing. Don't want to play. And instead of their teammates saying, don't worry about it, the fans are going to go, you're, you're one of us. Come out to the press and say, Petrov is a good player. Petter is okay. Get off their back. Stop booing them. Not one player stood up for Bobby Petter and Stigan Petrov. Obviously, when Martin O'Neill came and everything was fine, you saw the players they were. But at that time, not one player spoke out for their teammate. I feel sorry for Petrov, particularly, because he's a young kid coming over from Bulgaria, John. He didn't know anybody. That's a difficult thing. How, how, and how well did he turn out to be? Yeah, absolutely. Turned into a, a Celtic great now. John, I've really enjoyed speaking to you this evening. And uh, thank you for coming on and talking to us about your time at Celtic and also the 48 hours that uh, we've experienced on Twitter. You're now saying that that's it. It's, it's finished. You know, more. You, know, you know what I'm going to talk about now in terms of racism? Where we should talk about it in the community. Yes. Where black and working class communities are being given education, housing, job opportunities. And I'm sure the same thing goes on in, in Scotland. And that is what I talk about. I don't talk about the fact that, yes, I have done for the last two days because this has been the topic. But if you hear what I talk about when people say to me about, what about lack of black managers? I said, don't worry about black managers. I said, worry about what's going on in the inner cities in terms of the kids not being given opportunities educationally, socially, access to social care. That is what is real racism. The fact that you can't get a black manager, yes, that's a problem. The fact that black people can't get Oscars, yes, that's a problem. But the bigger problem is the disenfranchisement of working class people and black people in the inner cities. And that is what I want to talk about. And that's what. But of course, this has then got snowballed in the last two days because when I mentioned the fact, because people wanted to talk about football, which I did, and unfortunately, I do speak too much. And if you challenge me, I'll keep going on. Um, but after this, you'll never hear from me again in terms of racism in football. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. It's a pleasure. All the very best. Take care. Hell, hell. Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards.
We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018, and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for a Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode, and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting, I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support.